Lecture 27, Liar Liar. Obvious joke is obvious. Uh, I was thinking today about how people are quite adept uh, at building and using tools, although this is not totally unique. Uh, it's been observed, uh, of course, that in nature uh, other primates have figured out how to use tools, uh, and some birds even. Tools are good, uh, and profilers are tools. They're useful. They can mislead you. If you understand how they work, uh, then you can avoid being a little bit misled. Uh, I'll open with a video that shows one of the problems of sampling-based profiling, uh, and we'll just take a short clip from it. Uh, and the question I ask you is, you know, is this a fake? No, uh, it's not a fake. It's a real helicopter. It's really flying. What's happening, however, is that the camera captures images at a certain rate, uh, and that rate happens to be some multiple of the uh, blade rotation speed, so it gives the illusion that the blades aren't moving because they appear to be in the same position every time. This is a sampling problem. You can see that when you see a car commercial on TV where it looks like the wheels are spinning backwards. They're not, but the sampling effect of the camera can make it seem that way. So. The main assumptions underlying sampling are that samples are random, random in quotation marks, uh, and number two, that the sample distribution approximates the actual time spent distribution. That is, we get a representative sample uh, of the data that we are sampling. In the criminal justice system, uh, ask yourself, you know, who can we trust? Thing is, um, profilers give you some data uh, and you're using this to tell a story of some sort. If you watch a crime TV show, you'll see, you know, all right, you know, the uh, prosecution presents some evidence and they say, all right, well, you know, we have DNA of the suspect at the scene and the jury says, aha, they're guilty, you know, we sentence the defendant to 2,000 years in prison. When you're in court, though, both sides are telling you a story based on the evidence that is available. It should be the same evidence in both cases, so, and the, the DNA, although we tend to think of DNA in a court case as like it is a silver bullet, you know, the DNA is found, aha, it's the suspect, they did it, the end, that's not always the case. Um, the DNA might tell you that a person was in contact with another person, and that might be very useful in figuring out, okay, this is the person who committed the crime. Uh, however, it's just a piece of evidence, uh, and the reality is that in a court case, we say that the evidence is consistent with the story that one side or the other is telling. So the prosecution says this person did it, uh, and they present the evidence, and the evidence is consistent with that story. The story may be correct or it may be incorrect. You don't necessarily have all the information you need to uh, come to a conclusion, um, but ultimately you know, the, the evidence uh, itself is just data. Figuring out whether or not a person is guilty or not guilty of a crime is, you know, in an adversarial criminal justice system like the one that we have, uh, based on the jury deciding which story makes the most sense, or alternatively, does the prosecution's story uh, hold up to the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt? Uh, and that is the same, really, for what happens with profilers. And what I'm going to do now is tell you some lies, things that profilers could tell you that uh, are data, but could be interpreted incorrectly. So part one is lies from metrics. Um, we're going to talk, uh, at least in the beginning, about CPU performance counters. Um, so this uh, is based off a blog post that's referenced uh, down here in the slides. That's also linked in the notes, of course. Uh, and the idea is uh, about what the performance counters that are in the CPUs can tell you. We've talked about mFence, uh, and mFence is used in several situations ensuring memory consistency and that everybody has the correct view of what's going on in the world. Uh, and um, if you look at mFence using your profiler, you may find that actually the spin lock doesn't take much time. We're not spending a lot of CPU time there, uh, but empirically replacing the spin lock approach with a different approach seemed to be better than expected. Okay. So 
to solve you know the mystery if you will we have to uh, dig down a little bit and find out why is it this way what can we observe what can we learn uh, and to that uh, and you create micro benchmarks and micro, micro benchmarks contain memory accesses to uncached locations or computations surrounded by um, store uh, pairs or mfence or locks to make a determination about which one of these is actually faster, right? You made a little program uh, and then you test it out and it gives you some information about what's gonna happen. Uh, and you use perf to evaluate the impact of mfence and compare it to using locks. Okay, so here's the perf annotate output. Um, it is not super um, legible, but you know, um, we can divine the information that we need out of this. Most important is the leftmost column here. Uh, you'll notice here that 30.37% of the time is spent on this move RCX R10, uh, and then another 21.57% uh, is spent on this add of uh, hex 1 to RAX. Okay, that looks weird. Uh, again, 21% is, uh, or 22% is spent here on this XOR operation, uh, and then uh, another 18.61% here is spent on this add 01 here to RAX. Um, okay, that looks maybe a little strange. That looks a little bit strange. Um, we can see that reads take 30 plus 22 equals 52% of the runtime, and locks take 19 plus 21 percent, so about 40 percent of the runtime. Okay, plausible, maybe. Let's look at mfence. Um, in the mfence approach, we can see that 42 percent here uh, is charged to the move, uh, and then uh, mfence is 0.20. And then 5.26% here for this add, uh, and then 43.13 here for this XOR, and then the M fence here is zero. I mean, it won't be literally zero, but it means it's so small uh, that it's uh, rounded off to effectively nothing. Uh, and in this case, it looks like our reads take 85% of the runtime, and M fence only 15. Because of the very nature of this topic, uh, there is a distinct possibility that you are immediately suspicious of these facts and figures as presented, uh, as you should be in a way that you might not be uh, if we were talking about it just in the context of profiling in general. Um, let's take a look actually at what we see. So uh, if we also look not just at percentages, but at the total number of cycles, uh, if we don't do any atomics or fences, then it takes um, 2.81 times 10 to the power of 9 cycles. With locks, it's 3.66 times 10 to the power of 9. Uh, and with M fence, it's 19.6 times 10 to the power of 9, which is to say that our 15% is a lie. Profilers, uh, even including costs of CPU operations, drastically underestimate the impact of mfence and overestimate the impact of locks. Uh, and also, taking you know fifty percent of a smaller pie is much better than taking twenty percent of a huge pie uh, in terms of performance. Um, in any case, what's really going on here? Um, mfence causes a pipeline flush and the costs are misattributed. If I go back here, like the M fence that occurs here, this is actually expensive, but all the costs are assigned to the XOR operation that precedes it. M fence makes all the other instructions run more slowly, uh, and it sort of camouflages its effect on the overall performance. Uh, you might jump to the conclusion that actually, uh, for some reason, this XOR is really slow, or, or the move is really slow, uh, or at the very least that M fence is not expensive, but because the profiling tool is not so exact, uh, it can assign blame to an adjacent instruction, uh, meaning that you jump to the wrong conclusion and you say, well, mfence is inexpensive, that can't possibly be where our problem is. Next kind of lie I want to tell you about is the long tail. The other type of lie that sampling can really hide uh, is the outliers problem or the long tail. So suppose we have a task that's gonna get distributed over many computers. So think of Google search uh, as this kind of thing, or you're just searching you know, all of the network servers to find the data that you're looking for. 
That's um, going to be you know, a uh, distributed problem, so you will have different response times from different devices, uh, and that's okay. However, uh, if you look at the latency distribution, it is likely that you see a long tail of events, which is that there are a lot of cases where it's done quickly, but occasional cases where you know, it's taking a lot longer than normal, uh, and so those, those ones where it takes a lot longer can really affect your average. So um, if you're doing a computation when you uh, need absolutely all the results or a search where you absolutely must check every single server, then you can only go as slow as the slowest step. For Google, this is not a problem. If it for some reason doesn't return you the exact thing you were looking for amongst its 8 trillion results that it provided, uh, you're not mad. Uh, you don't know the difference, um, but also uh, you, you probably... Um, you probably didn't want to wait a lot longer. You know, it wouldn't make sense, right? You, you wouldn't want that. It's also helpful in Google's case that they're under no obligation to give you everything. They will give you results and you get what you get. There's no requirement that they have checked all of their data everywhere to be absolutely certain that they have checked every single thing they know. Okay, so here's a a uh, quick diagram of a uh, histogram of disk read latencies where we're performing a 64 kilobyte read. So um, the graphic is a bit cut off and uh, that's not ideal, but we'll take it. Uh, in the uh, first peak, this is something that's cached in RAM, in which case uh, we get the data very quickly. Um, the second peak is uh, about 3 milliseconds, which is too fast for uh, magnetic hard drives, but it is uh, something that is found in the disk's cache. Uh, some hard drives have a cache on board, which allows them to uh, give some results a little bit quicker. Uh, peak 3 is disk uh, seek and read times, which is around 25 milliseconds, and then it drops off after that. Um, but interestingly, you get peaks at 250, 500, 750, and 1000 milliseconds. Uh, and this causes the um, 99th percentile time to be 696 milliseconds, which is a very long time, right? 99% of cases are resolved before that, but 1% of uh, cases are a lot more. You know, 750, 1,000, uh, I mean, the uh, CPU profile might show you only the stuff in the blue circle, where it seems like, yeah, it looks like things are mostly correct. You know, 95% of the time, it's less than 50 milliseconds, and you know, the rest of the time... Uh, you know, we're not too worried. Um, sampling profilers are not so good at finding a problem that looks like this because it throws everything into buckets, right? And you have these weird outliers and, you know, yeah, here's the bucket for when it takes more than 100 milliseconds and there's a few items in there, but you don't know how bad it is and you don't know what it looks like when that happens. So averages are misleading because we have these weird outliers. When something takes a thousand milliseconds, like why does it take so long? Can you know? Can we dig into that a little bit more? Okay. So the answer uh, is uh, actually based on CPU throttling. The uh, situation was that the kernel would throttle the CPU for processes that went beyond their usage quota, and the throttling was executed in such a way that the kernel puts all of the threads of that process to sleep until the next multiple of a quarter second. Whenever that happens, so every 250 milliseconds, uh, it wakes up all the threads, and if those threads are still using too much CPU, then they get put back to sleep for another quarter second. This uh, throttling will uh, end uh, if by happenstance there are not too many requests in a quarter second interval, so the kernel decides it doesn't need to throttle that particular process anymore because it's not exceeding its quota. Uh, so after uh, investigating, an engineer found this was happening on 25% of disk servers at Google for an average of half an hour a day with periods of uh, high latency for as long as 23 hours. Uh, and this problem had been happening for three years. So turning off that problem, uh, turning off that mode, solved the problem in a big way. Uh, and this was happening you know, on a grand scale at Google. So this was uh, not exactly a... Uh, not exactly a tiny thing that nobody noticed. Another problem uh, with sampling is that your uh, sampling rate is very important to determining what actually you observe. This is uh, a 
This is a data set from Lucene. Uh, it's a search indexer. If you have a bunch of data and you want to be able to search it efficiently in the way that, say, Spotlight works for um, Mac OS, uh, you could use Lucene. And if you profile the application with uh, the default uh, approach, uh, which uh, the default sample rate uh, for perf, which is one kilohertz, so 1,000 sec uh, cycles per second, 1,000 samples per second, we see nothing interesting whatsoever. We would say the application is at steady state and nothing is happening, nothing noteworthy. Doesn't go up, doesn't go down. If you crank up perf to its maximum sampling frequency of 100 kilohertz, we can see you know, there are some uh, peaks and valleys in the graph. You know, it, it goes up a little bit and then it stabilizes and then it uh, has a little peak and then it drops down again. A little more interesting. But it is, of course, the third graph at the bottom, which is the interesting one, isn't it? This is using a different profiler called Shim, uh, and it can sample at a rate of up to 10 megahertz. Okay, um, that gives you a much more interesting data. Uh, it shows a lot, of, a lot more uh, peaks and valleys, you know, spikes of usage, followed by little periods of nothing, including a, a big period where uh, it looks like you know the system is maxed out temporarily uh, before it drops down. And the question is, uh, why does perf sample so infrequently? Uh, and the follow-up question on that is that how does she even get around this? Well, for one thing, uh, perf samples are done with interrupts, and processing interrupts takes a fair amount of time, and if you crank up the rate of interrupts before long, you're spending all your time handling those interrupts rather than doing useful work. So sampling tools are usually uh, prohibited from sampling too often, right? Otherwise, you are not getting any useful data. Uh, you're just spending all your time recording what's happening and no time actually doing it. Uh, the shim approach gets around it by being a bit more invasive, so it does some instrumentation of the program, adding some periodically executed code that puts some information out there whenever there's an appropriate event, like a function return. Uh, and this produces a bunch of data, which can be dealt with later to produce something useful, so it requires a bit more post-processing. The instrumentation-based approach is more expensive in general, but as we've seen already with uh, Dtrace, for example, uh, you could put custom information on events that are interesting to you uh, without necessarily having a huge impact on a performing you know, production system. So, yeah, um, part of the idea uh, for Shim is being more invasive, uh, whereas Perf tries not to change anything about the program at all and just you know, interrupt it and ask what's happening. Uh, and part of it is delegating work to post-processing, which is an approach that we've seen uh, could work uh, quite well. The third kind of lie that I want to tell you about is lies from counters. So. There's a whole long blog post about this, but Rust compiler hackers were trying to include support for hardware performance counters, that is to say information what uh, is reported by perf. Um, this was because the option uh, dash Z uh, self profile uh, produced data that was too noisy. It wasn't uh, particularly actionable. There wasn't a lot you could do with it. Uh, so the uh, intention was to uh, see if we could come up with something produced by perf. Um, so counters are uh, a good way of doing some things that we want to do. They're faster than measuring time uh, and uh, a lot more deterministic, uh, you know, something like five orders of magnitude more deterministic uh, than something like sample-based profiling. Uh, thing is, of course, there are a couple of uh, catches. You have to do uh, a few things that change your program a little bit or at least change your compile options to get the most deterministic behavior out of your uh, out of your program. One is disable address space layout randomization because uh, different pointers uh, affect hash layouts. Uh, address space randomization is a security enhancement that uh, is used to uh, prevent some kinds of buffer overrun attacks uh, where you put some code in a buffer and then you try to redirect the flow of execution to the code that you put in there. Uh, and that kind of thing uh, is partly uh, prevented by address space layout randomization because you can't be sure where your code is going to end up because it changes on different runs of the program. Uh, 
However, because you know, a hash table uh, where you're putting a pointer into it, you know, what bucket that lands in might be computed based on uh, you know, the actual address of that pointer. Uh, Address-based layout randomization means you could get very different results from your hash tables uh, on different runs of the program. So if you want more deterministic results, you have to disable that. Not the end of the world. Uh, just uh, you know, don't don't do that in production systems for security reasons, but for profiling, you can. Uh, another thing you have to do is subtract the time spent processing interrupts. Um, okay. Uh, and another thing to keep things uh, consistent is profile one thread only uh, instead of all of them to make sure you're not getting uh, your data messed up by another thread. Uh, there is, however, uh, one tiny problem uh, that remains, uh, and that is, uh, so uh, speculative execution, for example, from AMD, you know, allows you to uh, continue uh, executing your instructions normally, even if we're uh, waiting for a branch or similar to be resolved. Okay, um, what do you do when it fails? Well, we just go back. You know, roll back to the point of divergence. Uh, but did you uh, roll back the perf counters? Uh, whoops, did, did we forget something? So your counters, depending on what CPU you have and uh, how well this problem has been addressed, if at all, uh, in the uh, CPU that you're working with, might include some counts for things that officially never happened. Uh, you'll remember we talked about uh, Spectre back in, uh, in Lecture 7. Uh, yeah, AMD speculates past atomics and rolls back, but forgets to roll back perf counters. Uh, and in CPUs that were made after Spectre, there's a hidden, hidden model-specific register called Speclock Map uh, that disables speculating past atomics, um, which could allow you to uh, protect against future things in that vein that somebody might discover. The last kind of lie that I want to tell you about is lies about calling context. We've talked uh, about the idea of um, the call graph uh, and a certain amount of, you know, how did we get here kind of thinking. Uh, and our profilers can tell us some lies about that uh, calling context. So we do have to be careful about this. This is somewhat outdated. It is a pretty specific technical problem that arises uh, under the gprof tool, and we don't talk about gprof anymore because, well, it has limitations and it's not a, an area of focus that we are uh, interested in. But it still makes for a good example of a time when a tool tells you the wrong thing. Uh, gprof uses two C standard library functions to compute uh, what it knows. There is profil and mcount. Uh, so profil uh, asks the standard library glibc to ask what instruction is currently executing, and you can do that at a rate of 100 uh, times per second. So that gives us uh, some breakdown. Uh, and mcount records call graph edges, which are recorded by the uh, instrumentation that's put in your program if you compile it with the dash pg option in GCC. Um, what we have here is that profile information is therefore statistical. It is every so often we are measuring and we are extrapolating from the data that we have measured. Whereas the call graph stuff, m count is exact because we put some instrumentation in the program that says every time a function is called, we write it down. So we're certain that that information is complete. Combining these two things, you can draw unreliable inferences. So if you have a method uh, easy and a method that's called hard, each of which is called once and hard takes up 99.9% you know, .9 of the CPU time, we'll see that when we are sampling, uh, we will find out what's you know, we'll find out what's happening every so often. Uh, so we'll write down, we're spending a lot of time in this uh, in this method hard, and so on and so on. Um, but we'll see that gprof could divide the total time by two and report incorrect results, right? Why does that happen? Well, you know, if main calls uh, easy uh, and you know, easy calls this math function one time and it's over with and it's done, uh, and... Uh, main also calls hard, uh, and hard calls the math function a lot of times, we'll just you know, expect to see lots of samples taken in the function calculating the math. Very good. Um, but you know, the, the fact that blame is divided equally between easy and hard is incorrect because it's taking some samples that it has, uh, which are, again, statistical, 
uh, and therefore not exact, uh, and combining it with the exact count it has of function calls and saying, well, I guess it was about 50-50. So results that you get from GProf uh, could be suspect, uh, in particular if you're looking at contribution of children functions to parents. Uh, so when you look at a specific function in your profiler, it might say, okay, the, the total time that this function took, in, including any function calls it made to other functions, is this. So that could be wrong because you know, blame could be uh, misattributed a little bit. Uh, total runtime, same thing, spent uh, in a particular function and its children, uh, same thing. It could be a little bit misattributed in that way by dividing things where it shouldn't. Uh, but call graph edges could be correct uh, if you are certain that there's only one way this function get call gets called. So function f is only ever called by g. If that's the case, then uh, there's no possibility of blame being misattributed because it always goes to uh, g. And we're certain that that is correct. Uh, and the other thing that uh, will work is if a certain function is always going to take the same amount of time to complete, like the rand function that returns a random number, because there's no variability in that, uh, you won't get lies about how long it takes to complete on average or anything, because it's always the same, and therefore there's no problem. Um, there are other tools as well. Um, there's Callgrind, uh, which is one of the uh, things that's in the uh, Valgrind tool suite, like Memcheck, Helgrind, Cashgrind. Uh, and it runs your program basically under supervision, as we've seen. Uh, and kcashgrind is a front end to Callgrind. Um, and as we know, anything in the Valgrind suite uh, gives good information, but it imposes a lot of overhead. Uh, and uh, we used to show a uh, more complex example here having to do with uh, having to do with how can you trick it uh, and basically uh, any tool can be tricked give it enough levels of indirection uh, there, there was an example where we had uh, you know, uh, the easy and hard and then if we abstracted that away by making them both go through a manager function uh, then eventually we would end up with blame being divided equally again uh, and so it's very important not to get too caught up in what your profiler says is the cause of a particular thing being slow or this is where all your time is going uh, if you are not certain uh, about uh, about what you're seeing because of the uh, tendency to try to divide blame up uh, amongst these uh, different functions uh, or combine uh, the information that it has uh, it could produce an inference, which is a good guess, but is ultimately incorrect. Uh, and you can't just rely on that tool and say, yeah, for sure, this was the case. Even in court, when they say uh, with DNA, they never say, you know, DNA proves conclusively that it is that person. They would say, you know, there is a one in three trillion chance that it was a different person, right? So you have to weight the evidence accordingly, uh, and you have to recognize the part that that information plays in the story. Uh, you know, if you're talking about you know, proving, all right, this person's DNA was on the body of the murder victim, okay, factually correct, but you have to combine it with other stuff you know, which is, you know, all right, well, maybe, you know, they lived in the same building, so there's a possibility that, you know, they met one another, they know each other, they hung out after work. You know, is that a possible explanation for why the person's DNA would appear uh, on the body of the victim? Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, and then you have to you know, consider the evidence in context, and you can't just say, aha, DNA convict, uh, you know, which is kind of what you see on CSI. Uh, but you know, CSI is uh, perhaps not a, uh, not a great uh, explanation of how the criminal justice system works, even if it might be entertaining television.